Good morning. It's so good to be together on the Lord today. It's so good to meet all of you. We look forward to getting to know, to know you better as the week goes on. I'm going to tell you a story as we begin because I know that you know Brother Jim Beerman here. When I had this accident in the early days, it required me to have several MRIs. And I am very claustrophobic. And if you've ever had an MRI, then you understand the problem. And so I went on one occasion to get an MRI, and they put me into the little tube, and they covered my eyes with a, uh, a cloth, and they said, don't take that cloth off your eyes. And so they slid me in, and after a minute, I thought, this is not so bad. Curiosity got the best of me, and I pulled the, the cloth off, and I started yelling, get me out of here. So they pulled me out. And uh, we sat there for a minute, and they said, uh, all right, you're ready to go back in? And I said, I'm not going back in. <laughs> and uh, I said, you're going to have to knock me out. So later, I had seen Jim Dearman, and I was telling him about that. And um, Jim said, well, Don, they make some things to, to help you. You know, you can take Valium and things like that. And I said, Jim, it's going to take something a lot more powerful than Valium to get me back in there. And he said... Have you tried listening to some of your own sermons? <laughs> and I thought, wow, a friend is not the So you can uh, tell him I said that to you. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why there are so many different churches in the world today? So many different practices and so many different beliefs? And is it possible that all the different denominations are right? Does God approve of the kind of confusion? Does it even matter to God? That's what I want to talk about in this lesson today. Why are there so many churches? Does it matter to God? Is He pleased with the situation in the religious world today? In fact, I want to begin the lesson with this question. What if I were to ask you exactly how many different churches are there in the world today? What would you say to that? Oftentimes when I have a Bible study with someone, I ask them that question. And the answer that I frequently get is, I don't know, a, a lot. And that's the right answer. There are a lot. In fact, I looked this up a while back, and there are over 43,000 different churches that claim to be Christian. I want you to think about how utterly confusing that is to a person who's seeking the truth. Because you've got one church over here who teaches this practice, and another church teaches exactly the opposite. And one church says item A is sinful, another church says item A is mandatory. Who is right? Can they both be right? And of course, some people say, well, it's good to have variety. You know, they all say, just choose the church of your choice. We're all going to the same place anyway. They're just different paths leading to the same location. Dear friends, May I respectfully tell you that God is not the author of confusion? When I read in the New Testament, I read about only one church. But when I look around me today, I see literally thousands, tens of thousands that profess to be the church of the Bible. Friends, how did we get from one in the Bible to thousands that exist today? And the answer is something went wrong. Something went badly wrong, but it didn't go wrong with God. It went wrong with man. Now, we're going to answer the question today, why are there so many churches? But before we can answer that, we've got to lay some groundwork. We've got to have some building blocks. Very simple, fundamental things, but we have to have these before we can answer the question. So the first building block is this. In the Bible, we read about only one church. I want you to imagine with me that such a thing exists as a time machine. And I want you to imagine that you can get in this time machine and you could travel back to the first century to the day that the, the church was established in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And I want you to imagine that you could walk up to one of these 3,000 people who were just baptized and they're still wet and you said to one of them, Sir, I would like to know... What denomination did you just become a part of? What would they say to you? I don't know what you're talking about. What, what do you mean? Well, I, I mean, 
what church did you become a part of? Did, did you become a Methodist? Did you become a Catholic? Did you become a Baptist? Which, which one was it? What would he say? He would probably say, I've never heard of a denomination. I've never heard of the Methodist, the Catholic, the Baptist, or I don't know these groups that you're discussing. All I know is I became a part of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And that would be right because there was only one. Acts 2 and verse 47 says, And the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. Now, that fits perfectly with what Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 18. From the scripture reading today, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Singular. Later, the Apostle Paul is going to echo this sentiment of the one church as he's speaking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. He says to them, Shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In the book of Ephesians, he later writes to the same group of people and he says that God has put all things under Christ's feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church, comma, which is his body. The church of Christ is the body of Christ. When you read about the church and you read about the body, that's the same thing. Now that becomes important because three chapters later in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, he says that there is one body. Now if the church is the body and there's one body, then friends, there's one church. May I tell you in a very respectful manner, when a person reads the New Testament, he is impressed by the fact that there was only one church. Now somebody says, God, we get that. We understand there's only one church, but what we're saying is there are different divisions within that church. There are different denominations, if you will, that are all part of that one church. Would that be okay if we wanted to do that? have different slivers, denominations, divisions of that one church. I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Corinth Church of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, I plead with you, brethren. The King James says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Underline that. That there be no divisions underline that, but that you be perfectly joined together, underline that, in the same mind and the same judgment, underline that. And so, all the church, all the congregations of the church should be speaking the same thing, no division, perfectly joined, same mind, same judgment. How does that match with what we see in the religious world today, in the different denominations and divisions and sects? Are they speaking the same thing? Are they perfectly joined together? Friends, it doesn't mesh at all. Now, more specifically, what was the problem at the Corinth Church of Christ that made Paul say this in the first place? You go down two more verses, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, Paul says, Now this I say that every one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, some people in the first century had the seeds of denominationalism. The seeds of division. Some were saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Paul Christian. I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm of the Apollos division. I'm a Christian, but I'm a, a Peter, a, a Cephas Christian. And Paul says, is Christ divided? This, this is wrong, brother. Was Paul crucified for you? How dare you call yourself after the name of Paul? Who wrote that? Paul. He said, you can't do that. Now, you've got to understand, before we ask the question, why are there so many churches in the Bible? There was only one church. Here's the second foundation that you've got to build upon, and that is God predicted that there would be a departure from that one church system, the one church pattern. Despite the clarity of the oneness of the church, God said men are not going to stick to that. Men are going to drift. They're not going to hold to my pattern. Now, you say where? Where, where did he say it? I'll give you some examples. One of them is what I mentioned a moment ago. Paul is speaking to the elders from the Ephesus Church of Christ, and he tells them to shepherd the church which was purchased by the blood of Christ. He says this. Listen to Acts 20, 28. For I know this 
that after I leave, after my departure, shall savage wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among your own selves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, the elders from the Ephesus Church of Christ, there's a departure that's going to come. And he said it's going to start with the leadership, also from amongst your own selves. Just tuck that away because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Let me show you another warning. It is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read it. Paul says, Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the King James says, Speaketh expressly. That literally means the Holy Spirit is speaking very plainly. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. There's only one. People are going to depart from that. What are they going to do? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods, from meats, which God hath received, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving from those who believe and know the truth. Now, this is what he says. There's going to be a departure. And he names two specific components of it. One, he said, they're going to say you can't get married. They're going to say that you aren't allowed to eat certain foods. Keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. Thus far, what we have is this. In the beginning, there was only one church. In the beginning, the Lord said, men are not going to hold to that. They're going to depart, and they're going to teach false doctrine. All right. Let's answer the question. Why are there so many churches today? How did a basic Bible belief system turn into literally thousands of denominations that exist today? Well, early on, there were splinter groups, and history tells us about the Gnostics that existed in 125, the Montanists in 156, the Manetians in 244, the Novatians in 251. So you have some small splinters, but one of the largest and most significant divisions that existed in the early church related to its leadership. Remember what Paul told the Ephesian elders? Also from amongst your own selves, it related to the leadership and a Roman emperor whose name was Emperor Constantine. Now, from the beginning of God's plan, the church was to be led by elders and then deacons who served under them. You can read about the qualifications of elders and deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Elders were to have authority over the congregation where they were members. That's all. That's the way God established it. Each congregation was to be autonomous, that is, self-governing. This congregation couldn't tell the Church of Christ down the road, this is how you're to function, because each congregation was autonomous. But what happened is, over time, elders from this church and this church and this church began to meet together to discuss their various problems, and when you get to the 300s, there is a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine who's starting to have interest in this group of people called the Church of Christ. Now, I want you to look at this timeline we have together. In this timeline, you're going to notice across the top, this green line is going to represent the Lord's Church. It's going to stay continuous throughout history. It's going to go back to the beginning in Acts chapter 2. But when we zoom in a little bit, you're going to notice this meeting that takes place in A.D. 313. This is a meeting that was organized under Emperor Constantine because in A.D. 313, he passed what was called the Edict of Milan. This ruling, this edict, this law, ended persecution against Christians. Prior to that, persecution against Christians was bad. Now you can imagine when he ended persecutions against Christians, he became popular. It got to be that the church, the rulers in the church, the elders in the church took up with Rome, with Rome and Roman leaders. 
And so the Roman government started gaining a lot of influence with the elders in the Church of Christ. And the end result was not good. This new relationship led to a meeting between elders in the Church of Christ and Roman officials. And in the year 325, there was something that history calls the Council of Nicaea. And this particular meeting, it gave rise to the first official departure from the New Testament church. It was at that particular meeting, the Council of Nicaea, that they took upon a new name. The Roman emperor said, we're going to call the church Catholic. That word means universal. And it's going to be the church of the Roman Empire. It's going to be the Roman Catholic church. And they're going to have a hierarchy that is very similar to the Roman government. You can notice that it seems to be lagging here. It's on. That's working, so the battery's working. There we go. Alright. They had a structure in the new Roman church that you can see is very similar to that of the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, you have <coughs> an emperor, advisors, and governors. Eventually, you're going to end up in the Roman Church with a pope and cardinals and bishops. It was never this way in the Church of the Bible. This Catholic Church that was part of the Roman Empire established its new and its own hierarchy. Now, Christians who were faithful to the Bible, those who stood against the newly created Catholic denomination, they were ostracized. They were persecuted. They had to meet in hiding. But history says the Church of Christ continued to exist. Now, historically speaking, after the formation of the Catholic Church, it grew in strength and number and political power. It created new doctrines and man-made traditions all the while, it had growing endorsements from the Roman government. In time, their doctrines were made laws, mandates. They were forced upon the members of the Catholic Church. In fact, I want you to notice the dates of some of these doctrines. Oops. All right, it's catching up with me all of a sudden here. Wow. I've had people sleep on me, but not the <laughs> Look at some of these dates. In the year AD 325, we had the Council of Nicaea. Following that, in the year 394, they came up with the doctrine of Latin Mass. That is what they called their meeting, their assembly together. In the year 593, the doctrine of purgatory was created. That is, if you die and you're not good enough to go to heaven, you go to a place of temporary suffering until you paid your debt, and then you can move on. We're going to talk about that later this week. In the year 606, the first official pope on the earth was established. That was Boniface III. In the year 1000, the doctrine of transubstantiation came into being. Transubstantiation teaches that when you partake of the Holy Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, that it literally becomes the flesh and literally becomes the blood of Jesus Christ, a very strange doctrine. In the year 1015, they came up with the doctrine of the celibacy of the priest. Do you remember we talked about in 1 Timothy 4 when they departed from the truth? One of the things they were going to say is, you cannot marry the celibacy of the priest. You know what they say about the priest? You cannot marry. The Catholic Church created a monster when they created that. We have seen that in our land in the last uh, several years. And then in 1054, the Catholic Church is going to end up splitting. And I'm going to tell you some more about that in a minute. Another one of the doctrines we noticed in 1 Timothy chapter 4, they said you could not marry and they're going to forbid that you would eat certain meats. I don't know if it's still this way, but when I was a kid in the public school system, you never had meat on Friday. You always had fish on Friday. Do they still do that? I don't know if they do that or not. Do you know why they do that? It's because of the Catholic Church and the belief about forbidding certain meats to be eaten. Exactly what 1 Timothy chapter 4 
was saying. Now, if you will look at the timeline, what you will see is for the first thousand years going up to about here, you only have two churches. You've got the one that goes back to the day of Pentecost, the one Christ established. You've got the Catholic Church that started in the 300s. But what you're going to see is when you get to 1054, the Catholic Church is going to go through a split of its own. Now, I zoomed out here so that you can see it in the scheme of things. The Catholic Church is going to split into what is called the Greek Orthodox. So zoom in a little bit tighter so you can see it here. But now you've got three churches. You've got the church established by the Lord. You've got the Catholic Church. You've got the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, we enter into a period that history calls the Dark Ages. During this period, what you see is man-made doctrines continue to roll out. We continue to have doctrines such as 1192, the idea of indulgences. Y'all heard of that, right? Indulgences was the idea that you could pay for a piece of paper that says your sins have been forgiven. That means you could buy forgiveness of your sins in advance. And so, if I wanted to go out and party and drink this week, this weekend, I would go to the church and pay them whatever the fee for partying and drinking is. That is, $100. It's been forgiven before I even do it. In fact, the church, the Catholic Church, made a lot of money on the sale of indulgences in the Middle Ages. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome was built largely from the sale of indulgences. Charles Spurgeon, famous preacher from years gone by, the 1800s, told a story about a Catholic priest who had gone out selling indulgences. And the story says that as he went out, he had a lot of money, he was traveling back, and a man beat him up and stole the money from the indulgences. They found out who he was. They went before the magistrate, the judge. The judge found out that before the man robbed the priest, he had bought an indulgence. And so the judge said, I can't really prosecute him for this because you've already forgiven him of it. How about that? Very interesting. In the year 1215, you can see the idea of the confession booth. If you've seen this in a Catholic church building or on television, there is a booth. There's got a divider between it. The priest sits in one side. The person, the parishioner, sits in the other side. You will go and confess your sins to this human being, and he will pronounce the forgiveness of your sins, which only God has the ability to do, but that's something they created. In the year 1311, sprinkling was put in place to replace baptism. Now you can have the choice of having water sprinkled on you or be immersed for baptism, which is what baptism means. In the year 1870, the Pope was declared to be infallible. When he speaks ex cathedra, that means when he's sitting on his throne, Anything he says is as if God said it himself. Now, when you get to the 1500s, you're going to notice there's a lot of activity on the timeline here. And that's because when you get to the 1500s, there were men such as Martin Luther who stood up and said, this is not right. Martin Luther was actually a German monk, a Roman Catholic monk in Germany, he particularly hated the sale of indulgences. He said, this is ridiculous. The idea that you can pay money for sin in advance, it's ridiculous. He hated the idea that the Pope had any authority. He said the Bible is the only source of authority. And he had such a protest that he ignited. He started a protest movement that history calls the Protestant the Protestant movement, the Protestant Reformation. In the year 1521, another denomination appeared. Shortly before the Lutheran Church came on the scene, they were known as the Anabaptist. You can see, I probably can't see it real well, but this is the Anabaptist. The Anabaptists started as a protest to the Catholic Church. They hated baptizing babies. 
Anna means again. They were the people who baptized again. So if you've been baptized as a baby, they would baptize you again because they said being baptized as a baby doesn't do you any good. Very interestingly, the Anabaptist movement spawned several other churches. The Baptist church came from them. The Amish church, the Mennonites, the Brethren in Christ. As religious freedom expanded, denominationalism grew and grew, and it spun into the multiple dozens of churches that you can see on the timeline, and it laid the foundation for the multitude of denominations that exist in the world today. Some of these churches began with a noble desire to go back to the Bible to say, we've got to do right. These things are not what the Bible teaches. Let's get back to the Bible. Others began with a less than noble desire. In fact, if you can notice this, I know you can't quite see it here, but what I've got pointed out here is the year 1534 and the beginning of the Church of England. The Church of England was the result of King Henry VIII saying, I want the Catholic Church to annul my marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And the Pope said, no. And the King said, you will. And the Pope said, we won't. And he said, if you will not, I will start my own church. And he did. He started the Church of England in 1534, and it has existed since that time. And so the King, or the Queen of England, is the head of that church. Now what's the point of all of that? The point is, this chart, this timeline, represents a small fraction of the churches that exist today. Some began with good motives, others had bad motives, but they were all started by men. Now, if we go back to the top of this chart, you'll see the green line represents the church that was started by Jesus Christ. It is the church that was started in AD 33 in Jerusalem. It's the church of Christ. It's the one that you read about on the pages of the New Testament. And from history, we can see all other churches were man-made. Now hopefully, without going through 43,000 of them, you can see the answer to the question, why are there so many churches? But this is what I want us to get from this. I want to go back and be a part of the church that Jesus established. So let's ask some questions. Number one, what does that mean for people today? Somebody says, Don, does that mean that all the denominations that exist today are wrong? <clears throat> Friends, I want to be kind, but I want to be clear. And the answer is, it has to mean that. It has to mean that. All churches, except the one built by Jesus Christ, exist without New Testament authority and without New Testament example. Next question. Does that mean that all good, morally upright people who are part of those denominations are going to be lost? I'd rather not answer that question. I'd rather let the Lord answer this question. Matthew 7, 21, this is what Jesus says. This is a scene from the Day of Judgment. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me, not a few, not a couple, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. I want you to look at this. Friends, on the day of judgment, there are people who call Jesus Lord. They believe that he is their Lord. There are people on the day of judgment who believed that they were prophesying. They were doing many wonderful works. They were teachers. They were preachers. Some of them were fakes, but some of them genuinely believe. As deep people are saying, Lord, you can nearly hear the shock in their voice. These are people who are good intentioned people. But I learned from this that having my heart right is not enough. I actually have to be right. I actually have to do what the Lord said. Again, listen to Acts 2.47. Praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord added to 
the church daily, those who were being saved. Friends, all of the saved were added to the church. The one built by Jesus Christ, the one that existed in Acts chapter 2, the one that you read about on the pages of the New Testament, the one that existed prior to all of the denominations, the one that he was warning, there's going to be a departure, people are going to teach all of these other things. Question number three is, how do I become part of that church? That's what I want to know. How do I become a part of the church I read about in the New Testament? And the answer is, same way they did in the New Testament, you've got to obey the gospel. You know, sometimes people in the religious world will say, there's nothing that you have to obey. You just believe. All you have to do is have faith. All you have to do is believe. There's nothing about obeying or doing anything. I want you to listen to the words of 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8. This is also a judgment day passage. The Lord says to the faithful Christians, On that day you who are troubled will be given rest. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, now listen to this part, and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord said there is something you have to obey. He calls it the gospel. And he says, if you don't obey the gospel, then the Lord is coming with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those. So what does that mean? How do I obey the gospel? Now we oftentimes sum it up in five words. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I think sometimes we do a disservice because we say you've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. What does that mean? Would you bear with me for just a minute and let me explain these things? What do we mean when we say you have to hear the gospel? What we mean is you need to hear that because of sin, man has transgressed the will of God. And because of that, he is destined to go to hell eternally. We mean Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Not physical death, eternal death means you're going to go to hell. He must hear that Jesus Christ, God, came in the flesh to pay the penalty for his sin so that he doesn't have to go to hell. He has to hear that salvation is only in Christ. And Romans 10, 14 indicates if he doesn't hear, then he has no hope. Hear, believe. What do we mean by believe? What does that entail? A person has to believe. He has to understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That means he is deity. He came from God. John 8, 24, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. You've got to understand the deity of Christ. John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh. Who's the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God was made flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How it is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 and 8. How that he arose, defeating death, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. And then Romans 10 and verse 9, If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, death, burial, and resurrection, you will be saved. Friends, it is crucial that a man must believe and understand the body of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.10 says that salvation is in Christ. How can you be saved in Christ if you don't know what it means to be in Christ? If you don't understand the body of Christ? Hear, believe, repent. Tomorrow night, the sermon is about repent. Or maybe it's Tuesday night. Monday or Tuesday night, the sermon is about repent. What does that mean? Acts 17 and verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. A short definition of repentance is this. A change of mind that is brought about by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. That means I hear the gospel and then I believe it. What, I'm, what, what am I believing? What I've heard. I've heard it and I believe it and it pricks my heart. That is, 
I'm going to go to hell. And it changes my thinking. And I think, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I want to go to heaven. It's natural. You see the progression? I hear it. I believe it. It works on my mind. I repent. And then I confess it. What am I confessing? I'm confessing what I heard and what I believed. What's the Bible say about the confession? Romans 10 and verse 10 says, With the heart man believes toward righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto or toward salvation. That doesn't mean you're saved at the point of salvation. It takes you unto, toward salvation. In Acts chapter 8, Philip teaches the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel, and the Ethiopian says, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip responds, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. In Acts 8, 37, he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Sometimes we call that the good confession. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. That is not the good confession. Why do I say that? I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is not the good confession. That's just a summary of it. The good confession is all those things I've heard and all of those things that I believe, but I summarize it when I say I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because if all that, if that is true, all the rest is true. But I have to believe all of it. And I am, I've heard all of it and I believe all of it. And what I'm saying is I believe every bit of that. And I'm going to summarize it with the words I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hear, believe, repent, confess. What am I confessing? What I've heard and what I believe and what's changed my heart made me repent. Then I confess, yes, I believe those things. And then I am baptized. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Baptism as practice in the first century was immersion. That's the meaning of baptism. It means Immersion. It is the point at which a person contacts the saving blood of Jesus. It's the point at which he has obeyed the gospel. Romans 6 and verse 3 says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Where did Jesus shed his blood? Into his death. I am baptized into his death where he shed his blood. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. And so, I'm lost, I'm buried into his death, I contact the blood, and I come up as a new creature to walk in a new life. Have you ever thought about the fact that people who say you can be saved without being baptized are really saying that you can be saved without the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> because it's in baptism that we contact the blood of Jesus. When you do that, the Lord adds you to the church. Acts 2.47. Friends, the church of Christ still exists today just like it did in the first century. Sometimes people have a misunderstanding when they hear us say church of Christ because they think that it is just another denomination along a long string of denominations. That's not what we mean at all. We are not saying, in fact, what they're hearing is they think that we're saying you need to leave your denomination and become a part of our denomination. Our denomination is better than your denomination. Our denomination is going to heaven and your denomination is not. Friends, that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is man needs to leave all denominations and just go back and be the church of the Bible. When we say church of Christ, did you know in the Bible, church of Christ is not a name. It is a description. Literally, it means the church of or belonging to Christ. The church which belongs to Christ. That's what we're saying. We want you to just be a member of the church that belongs to Christ. And do the same thing that they did to be a part of the church that belongs to Christ. And then worship like they did as a part of the church that belongs to Christ. That's what we're asking you to do today. If you go back to the top of the chart and you see the line, the church of Christ that was established in Acts chapter 2 still exists 
after all these years, and we can still be a part of it. And still today is the only place where salvation can be found. Maybe today you want to be a part of that church. We invite you to do that today by obeying the gospel, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. If you want to do that today, we're ready to assist you. If you're here today and you may say, well, I'm already a member of the church, but I haven't been living faithfully. I want to make my life right. We would be honored to go ahead to God and pray for you today. Maybe you say, I don't understand this. I want to have a study more about here, believe, and Pentecost, be baptized. We would be delighted to do that. This morning, you've got opportunity. We invite you to come as together we stand and sing this invitation.